Good evening, everybody. Once again, welcome back to Southeast Seventh Day Adventist Church in Cleveland, Ohio. This is our prayer meeting. Uh, we have had about 45 minutes of prayer uh, and praise, and now we're going to do our study uh, for tonight. I am Pastor Stan Hood. Our website is se, the number seven, the word day, dot org. You can always go back to our YouTube and watch all the previous uh, editions of everything, our Bible studies, our worship service, prayer meeting, everything. Uh, I want to say to our members, it was a pleasure to bring these insightful topics to you uh, because uh, we want to stretch you. We want to stretch your mind with learning, and also we want to stretch your stamina and what you can take in to what you give back out because the goal is for all of us to be teachers not just to be taught, but to become teachers. And, and that by uh, doing that, uh, in order to do that, we have to become effective creators. We're going through this process together. And I know sometimes we get tired, but this is how we stretch. This is how we get stronger. And so we'll try to be efficient. Uh, this is what we are studying currently. It's called The Secret Terrorist. It's a great uh, little book. Uh, talking about the history of Jesuit activity, uh, not just in America, but across the world. And I understand that this kind of thing is not for everybody and it's okay. Uh, but if you are uh, a, a good student of history, if you like things like the great controversy, uh, the whole opening chapters of the great controversy is about this kind of stuff. So we're dusting it off because the world is in trouble and we want to be ready. All right, with all that said, we're on chapter four. We're in the middle of it uh, on President Abraham Lincoln. And as we go along, we're, uh, after we finish with this, we're gonna talk about the sinking of the Titanic, World War I and II, uh, President JFK, the Waco massacre, Oklahoma City bombing, the World Trade Center attack, and religious terrorism in America. We're going to talk about all these things so that we can be well-rounded. Let's pray. Father, thank you for uh, giving us this uh, platform and this time together. Now, as we go forward, we ask, Lord, that you visit us with wisdom and understanding and discernment, and you bless our talk tonight. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen and amen. All righty. So, uh, we're going to get started from where we left off from last week, and uh, I, I tried to organize this tonight in a way that we would finish tonight, but then I just couldn't help myself. I saw one sentence, and it made me insert some stuff, uh, so we're gonna, we're gonna uh, see what we can do with this. I, I forgot who was reading last. Uh, was it Elder Stone or, uh, or Elder uh, Parker? I can't remember, but if either one of you are uh, available tonight, uh, can you help me with a little reading? Okay, I'll do that. Thank you, sir. Chapter four, President Abraham Lincoln, page 49. Compare these words with the doctrines and principles taught by the councils, the decrees of the Pope and the laws of Holy Inquisition. And you will find that the sentiments of belief of Booth flow from those principles as the river flows from its source. And that pious Miss Surratt, who the very next day after the murder of Lincoln said, without being rebuked in the presence of several other witnesses, the death of Abraham Lincoln is no more than the death of any N-word in the army. Where did she get that maxim? If not from her church? Okay. So this is deep here. And I, I apologize if it messes with your sensitivities. But to, to recap, for those who didn't see last week or a lot happened in your life and you don't remember, Mrs. Surratt is a person who allowed them to plan the assassination of Abraham Lincoln in her home. These are disgruntled, uh, com Confederates who are mad because they lost the war and they didn't want to give it up. Booth and 
All these people were able to use her home to plan the assassination of the president. And, uh, and yes, if you haven't guessed by now, she was a devout Catholic. And so, uh, and the Pope was in constant contact with Jefferson Davis and others. So this is more than some nut. And we're gonna prove that tonight. And I won't get this off the screen because I know some people are sensitive, you know, get triggered by it. But hey, this is what she said. And uh, so it is what it is. Now, uh, if I can take over just for a minute, uh, Elder Park, and I'll give it right back to you. I thought this would be a good place to bring some receipts, <laughs> right? Uh, uh, because this whole, this language that Mrs. Surratt just used was racist language. And you so, said, well, what does that have to do with Booth killing Lincoln? Look at this. August 14, 1985, the Pope apologizes to Africans for slavery. I just, I did a screenshot right from the, this comes from the New York Times. It doesn't come from some popcorn uh, rag magazine. This is the New York Times. And, and this was John Paul II at this time it, with uh, 1985. He apologizes. Okay, well, what's, what's inside the article? The uh, Pope John Paul II today apologized to Black Africa for the involvement of white Christians in the slave trade. Okay, and so they use little pictures like this to show that conversion was forced. It was not voluntary. Okay, uh, here's another article by Allison Gaines. Uh, December 23rd, 2020. That ain't that long ago, is it? It says how Pope Nicholas V used the church to start the disgraceful slave trade. Religious dogma created the dehumanization of African indigenous people. Wow. That's a mom. I'll let you take that in. Inside the article, she says, in 1452, Pope Nicholas V charged Alfonso of Port Portugal with the Christian duty. Did that say Christian duty? Yes, it did. The Christian duty to enslave any non-Christians. Now, how they convinced the Pope to do this, because before the Catholic Church was against slavery, but what they did is they gave the Pope 100 African slaves for himself, and he split them up and gave some to bishops and priests and so forth, and they were clean, well-spoken, they were treated good, and this convinced Pope Nicholas V to, uh, to publicly endorse slavery, and it was supposed to be for non-Christian Africans. But once they got that endorsement, they attacked everybody, okay? So the Pope's act would be the first recorded international edict to literally grant a Christian nation the right to promote, enforce, and heavily profit from slave trading. Now, what I wanna to say to you right here, and I just wanna put this on the record, is not an unknown thing, but sometimes we need to be reminded that with the transatlantic slave, uh, slavery, three out of four Africans starved to death on the way to America. Let me say that one more time. Three out of four Africans starved to death on the way to America. Okay, just want to leave that right there because before you get all hyped, I want to show you something else. The Catholic Church forced their views onto African and ind indigenous people. There was no peaceful conversion. Let me read that one more time. There was no peaceful conversion and mending of ideological differences. Conversion by missionaries was historically violent, dehumanizing, and destabilizing for African nations. White people justified African enslavement because they did not deem non-Christians worthy of respect. They did not deem non-Christians worthy of respect. Now, we know now, looking backwards, that many of these Africans were actually Christians, but it didn't matter. Okay, but before we go any further, so now we understand why Jesuits had no problem with the Civil War. They had no issues with joining Jefferson Davis and uh, General Lee's side of the war because they always felt that way. They endorsed it long before it came to be. 
But remember what I told you about evil. It takes both sides of the argument. Remember I told y'all that? You remember that, Elder Parker? I just want to get a witness. Yes, sir. They take both sides of the argument. Now, it's estimated that 5 million Africans were brought to America. But guess what we don't talk about? The Arab slave trade of East Africa. I don't know why we want to keep trying to make people our friends who are not our friends. They don't like us. Just, just get over it. Stop being so insecure. They don't like us. Right? So look at this. This is another, another article from World History. Uh, it's called History, Historyville. That's the place where this article comes from. Between 650 and 1900, the year 650 and 1900, historians estimate that 10 to 18 million, look at that, 10 to 18 million, that's three times as many that came to America, were enslaved by Arab uh, slave traders and transported over the Red Sea, Indian Ocean, and through the desert. So this is a slavery going the other way, not coming to the West, but being taken further East. That is what, that's what happened. So it's three times as many that came to America, but because they were enslaved by Arabs, we just don't talk about it. And so let's go into the article. Was it a Muslim slave trade? The Arab slave trade is sometimes referred to as the Islamic slave trade but slavery was not driven by a theological mandate. However, if a non-Muslim population refuses to convert to Islam, the non-Muslim population is regarded at war with the Muslim nation, and it is authorized under Islamic law to enslave that population. Now, let me, if you haven't figured out the obvious, let me point it out to you. How can European be enslaving Africans because they're, uh, because they're not Christian and they're Muslim, so it's free to enslave them and take them West, but at the same time, how can Eastern Islamic people be enslaving the same Africans because they're Christian and not Muslim? Oh, did y'all catch that? <laughs> did y'all catch that? These are the exact same people. One group is enslaving them because they're not Christian, so they're less than. Another group is enslaving them because they're not Muslim and they're Christian. Well, which one are they? Let me just pause right there because I don't want to lose nobody. I'm almost done. Anybody have any questions about what I just said or any thoughts about it? None? Okay, so I guess that we all still on the same page. Remember, I told you, evil takes both sides of the argument. The problem is that you're not Christian. And somebody else says the problem is that you're not Muslim. But either way, poor little peaceful Africans are just in a bad way. Deacon King, man, go right ahead. I am um, very touched and moved. I had no idea that it was enslavement of, of my um, sisters and brothers from generations past was to this extent and this hostile. Uh, yet, there has to be to your um, involvement, I am so happy because I have the emotional tie that, gosh, we were caught in the middle and thank God that we have the, the history that we survive and still exist to this day. Because with those types of actions from generations past, it seems like it was an attempt to totally erase us from the existence of the earth. And so I just wanted to just say this, that because of who we are and who God is, we endure and we have to keep this history known so that we don't forget and give up when we know that we have come from a generation of survivors and achievers. Because look at what the good side has brought. And that's why we here now as Christians, mm -hmm. as believers, and as achievers. Amen. Amen. And you're exactly right. It was simply this. 
first of all, how in the world is the church involved in this evil? That's the first problem. Uh, the second issue is let's tell it like it is. Some barbarians thought that they had extreme amount of confidence that they were the best in the world at everything. And then they went south and discovered an entire continent that, that, that had people who were so advanced in their technology, in their organization, in their health practices, in medicine. And they said, let's hurry up and erase this. That's what took place. That's not my opinion, that is a fact. Uh, they were so intimidated and by this group of people who were so sophisticated and uh, they were not violent. They were not walking around naked. All of these things are lies. Many of the things that helped Europe survive uh, over the last five centuries was what they learned in Africa. And all these things that we apply to the Greeks when it comes to medicine and philosophy and all of that, they openly say they got it from Africans. Even, the, even things concerning cleanliness and the structure of cities and streets and sewers and food and uh, met, all of that. Uh, but the, the thing is, they could not, and I'm talking about those barbaric tribes who moved south, they could not handle what they found. And because these people were so nice and because they were so accommodating, they just got full of the devil and took advantage of them. But this is coming from two sides. So you're right, uh, 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 Deacon King, man. It was coming from two different sides. It's coming from the West and from the East. Well, also from the North. And, and, uh, and surviving this is nothing less than a miracle. But I'm not finished. I'm going to let y'all talk in just a minute. But I'm not finished showing you how evil this is. First of all, I want you to know that the Vatican was pulling the strings. You can leave your hands up, I'll come to you in a minute. The Vatican was pulling the strings on all sides. They had people thinking these are opposing forces, but they're all coming from the same place. Now, let me read this page once again, because I don't wanna, want you to lose what we found here. The Arab slave trade is sometimes referred to as an Islamic slave trade, but slavery was not driven by a theological mandate. However, if a non-Muslim population refuses to convert to Islam, the non-Muslim population is regarded at war with the Muslim nation. And it, it is authorized under Islamic law to enslave that population. So again, I wanna say this before I move to the next slide. Europe is saying it's okay to enslave African people because they're less than human, because they're not Christian. And the East was saying it's okay to enslave African people because they're not Muslim, because they are Christian. So my question was, which one is it? And I'm gonna answer it for you. Here is another article from July 18th, 2021. The plain and simple hidden truth about Islam. You ready? Here it comes. Muhammad, before this time, Augustine had, uh, before this time, Augustine became the Bishop of North Africa and was effective. Remember, you learned last night that North Africa was colonized. When we talked about Cleopatra, remember that? North Africa is colonized uh, and was effective in winning Arabs to Roman Catholicism, including whole tribes. It was among these Arab converts to Catholicism that the concept of looking for an Arab prophet developed. Muhammad's father died from illness and, son and sons born to great Arab families in places like Mecca were sent into the desert to be suckled and weaned and spend some, some of their childhood with Bedouin tribes for training and to avoid the plagues in that city. After his mother and grandfather also died, Muhammad was with his uncle when a Roman Catholic monk learned of his identity and said, take your brother's son back to his country and guard him against the Jews. For by God, if they see him and know of him, that which I know, 
they will con construe evil against him. Great things are in store for your brother, my Muhammad, your brother's son of yours. The Roman Catholic monk had fanned the flames for future Jewish persecution at the hands of, and, and of the followers of Muhammad. The Vatican desperately wanted Jerusalem because of its religious significance, but was blocked by the Jews. So what they did was they groomed Muhammad. They groomed him to create this religion called Islam, even marrying a Catholic nun to help him write uh, the Quran because they became the hidden soldiers of Catholicism to eradicate and displace the Jews from their land. Now, I wish that I was making that up, but it is just a fact. Now, let me add this one last caveat before I move on and give it back to Elder Parker, who I'm gonna get some hands, uh, is that the, the folks who, who want so bad to associate us with either the nation of Islam, which is totally different than the Islamic peace, people of the East. The nation of Islam is founded by a white man passing as black who taught a black man who was passing at white to treat to teach black men how to hate white folks. If that's confusing to you, that's because it's crazy. <laughs> All right. Let me say it one more time. The nation of Islam was created here in America by a white man passing as black who taught a black man, Elijah Muhammad, passing as white to hate all <clears throat> white people. Wow. That's why uh, the, the Islamic nations don't even acknowledge the nation of Islam. So you got to be, well, people don't do their homework, but you got to be crazy to believe that, that this hate is divinely appointed by God. Then I want to share one more thing with you. When it comes to the uh, Arab slave trade, while they enslaved uh, 18 million Africans, they also enslaved 1.25 million Europeans. So the Vatican was using them to enslave European enemies just as they were enslaving Africans. So they didn't discriminate between white folks and black folks. It's just that we are not allowed to talk about that. All of our energy is focused toward what happened here, but there's a whole nother story all across the islands and, and uh, in England and everywhere else in Australia, they all have their stories of this oppression that was generated by Jesuits. And that, brothers and sisters, is the truth. All you gotta do is look for it. Okay, Elder Parker, go right ahead. Oh, Sister Gladys, I'm sorry, Sister Gladys had her hand up first. Yeah, well, yeah, I'm, I'm here. I, I, I was just wondering about Deuteronomy 28, chapter 28, um, mm -hmm. where, it's, where just to sum it up, it was the Most High was saying that um, if we obey him and keep his commandments, that we will be blessed in the city and blessed. But if we didn't, then all these curses would come upon us. And he's telling us that we'll be taken away by ships. He's telling us that they'll, we'll be in a country where we won't understand their language. He's telling us that there no man will buy us, which I take to mean that no man is going to be able to redeem us because we have no country. No, you know, there's many cities in Africa. Africa is a continent. And there's nobody's, nobody's there to claim us. Like Germans can say, well, you know, I'm from Germany. Japanese can say I'm from Japan, but we, we say we're from Africa, a continent, but we, we can't specify what city. But anyway, he says, he said, there's nobody, no man's gonna redeem you because he's gonna be the one to redeem us. He's gonna come and win us back because we are special to him. That's why we're so hated because we are special. He said that if you, if you serve me, you're gonna be hated by the world. And so we, even though you're, what you're saying is true, I believe these were the tricks of Satan to put us into this bondage. It, it was all, it didn't catch God by surprise what happened to us. And, but I appreciate what you're saying, but what do you think about that? Uh, what, what I think is that uh, we have to be careful with that. Uh, while we can 
we cannot identify um, a whole bunch of different groups that fulfills this prophecy. Uh, the first thing is it's our own disobedience that triggered the beginning of all of it. It's our own unwillingness to stop chasing other gods and chasing other nations. And so do I believe that applies to, to uh, melanated Africans? Yes, but I cannot ignore that we play a part in it. And it's not that that's what God wanted. It's clearly not what he wanted us to just obey him. Uh, but the, the thing is, some of the things that God says, some of the conditional promises, they apply to a whole lot of people, not just us. If anybody obeys God, they'll be blessed. If anybody disobe disobey God, they leave themselves open for the enemy to come in and wreak havoc in their lives. Is that not true? Yes, that's true. I'm looking at the curses. I'm looking at the curses too, and the blessings. He, he makes yeah. it rain upon the, the, the just and the unjust. unjust. Yeah. The wheat and the tears are gonna to grow together, but he's gonna yeah. do the separating. And, but I understand what you're saying. I do, I really do. Okay, yeah, I believe that we are as melanated people special to God. And I also believe that other people are special to him as well. The, the whole point of following the Abrahamic line is so that they would become a witness to the whole world and convert the whole world to, uh, to, to the belief in this one creator God. Uh, God, at, at, there's no time that God did not want to save everybody. There is no time that, that, uh, that he said, well, I'm gonna just forget about the rest of them and I'm only gonna focus on you. No, he says, I'm gonna use you to get to the rest of them. That's why he tells his disciples to go into all the world and teach and preach. And you're supposed to be the salt of the earth and the light of the world. He always wanted whosoever to become his family. Uh, while it is, it is a unique story for sure, the, the, the plight of Africans is a unique story. Um, we, we can't disregard that the Jew in present time is spiritual. To the Jew in this present time, according to what Paul teaches, is spiritual. See, what God really wants, other than our skin, other than our family line, is our heart. That's what he really wants more than anything, uh, because he knows what's best for us. And the reason I said we have to be careful is because we will exchange God and worship at the altar of suffering. You know, God never intended for our identity to be suffering. You know, it's, he never intended us to pray to it every day, to, to lament over it every day, to bring out the, that's when people see us, they see suffering. That's not what God intended. He intended that when people see us, they see him. Does that make Teach. sense? Teach. Because yes. what has happened to a lot of our people is that something that we should be proud of. We should be proud of the fact that God has saw us through all of this and we still have an opportunity to go back to him. We should be proud of that. But what has happened to a lot of our people is this has become a crutch, a handicap, an excuse for underachieving. Well, I can't be anything because the whole game is rigged against me. And I don't believe that's what God intends for his people at all. I think he intends for us to ride on the high places of the earth to take what has happened to, he wants us to do what Moses did. Moses, when Moses realized the plight of his people, he says, I'm not no longer going to participate in the evils of Egypt. I'm going to take off this royal robe and become one of them. I'm going to become a champion for one of them. That's I why believe he says that. That's so go ahead, go ahead. I was going to say in Revelations where he says, here's the patience of the saints. Here are those mm -hmm. that keep the commandments of God and the testimony of Yeshua or Jesus Christ. And I, yeah. I, 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 there is, there is, it's not a race thing. It's a spiritual thing, like you said. And a lot of people, once they come to realize our ancestors caused this, caused our, you know, God didn't expect for it to go the way it expected. I don't know. I really don't know, but it's not a it's not a race thing, and 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 I think that um, it's more of a spiritual thing for me. Mm -hmm. 
Oh, no, I wasn't talking about you. I was taking the opportunity because this is a, a, a common conversation I have with people. Uh, where, where is the line between uh, national pride and spiritual discipline? And, and all of this is an issue because we are, we are still in an identity crisis. As you, so, uh, uh, as you so eloquently put it, we're the only people who cannot trace our roots all the way back to the beginning. And that messes with our psyche. And it causes us then to, a lot of us, to want to reach out and attach ourselves to anything that validates us. And God says, look, come to me. I'll validate you. Beyond what's on the outside, I want to change you from the inside out. And I'm not saying you're against that. I'm just, I just took the opportunity to talk about it because it's a, a common conversation. Even in my own family, it's, a, it's a, a conversation. People who don't go to church, people who don't read their Bible, they don't pray. They're always talking about how, uh, you know, we just cursed, we just, we just beat down and, and we don't have a chance. And, and that's not the God I serve. God is the champion of the disadvantage. Is that not true? Yes, 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 he is. Yes, he is. Okay, all right. I just got on the on my horse and started riding, <laughs> Sister Glad. <laughs> <All right. laughs> because I, I start getting mad when people, and I didn't say you did it, but people start acting like, well, here it is. You know, we were cursed and you know, it just is what it is. No, no, no. It's not about your beginning, it's about your ending. Amen. Okay, I saw hands dropping. I probably talked too long. Can I, have, can I, can I say Billy, hey, Billy, Billy, go ahead. All right. <laughs> you know, the, the, the thing that I was telling my family last night is this. God is trying to teach us a new language. He says, mm -hmm. come out of this world. This mm -hmm. world and God is different. Okay, this world, we say what we can't do. God tells us what we can do. When I was doing my thing out here is because I didn't know my purpose in life. When you don't know your purpose in life, you live foolishly. Hmm. You uh, have no goals. You, you, when you started a goal and you don't stick to it, so you jump from here to there. But when you start taking in the word completely, this is why he says uh, uh, sanctification is a work of a lifetime. Because God's got to get all this worldly crap out of us. We are not dealing with flesh and blood. We're not dealing with rich or poor. If we were, I believe in, in, in Revelations, when he talks about the mark of the beast, he would mention denominations, which he doesn't. Mm -hmm. He said, great or small, <laughs> rich or poor, he don't care, he just wants worship. And yeah. anytime we're not following God, who are we worshiping? See, so if God is abiding in me and I'm in him, he points out all these things of history that we're learning. We can see how it works. Mm -hmm. God says he calls us his friends, those who do what he says. So he reveals the mysteries to us. Now, <clears throat> I know who I am now. I know I'm a royal priesthood. I know that uh, um, God chose me. I didn't choose him. He chose me, I accepted him, and I'm the heir of God. That's all that counts for me. I am not one of these brothers. I, if my family will tell you, I ain't trying to find out who is who and all that. It might be good for some folks. I don't miss my daddy. My mama did a great job. All I know today is, is that God came into my life. He turned me around. He set my feet on solid ground. I know who I am in him. I know how special everyone is. I know the smoke screens about, about uh, black and white. I'm so glad my mama didn't teach us prejudice. But the point is, I know that, that those are nothing but rabbit holes. You understand? Yeah. So when I look at things today and I can, the word explains itself, but let God's light shine in you. That's what draws people to want to know who this Christ is, that you are, 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 oh no, I don't like all the things that's going on today, but I know why they're happening. Right. That's a difference. 
and I know that I have hope in him and everybody's looking for some hope and they're looking for some peace. So when it doesn't disturb my peace, this opens the door for me to tell them who you really belong to. Give him a chance. When she started out today, taste and see how good the Lord is. It's the only reason you are alive. So I, I'll stop there because I can go on and on. Man, you sound like you, you're doing a little better. You, you, you got a little wind there for this one. That's good. I know <laughs> you've been battling. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Well, praise the Lord for that. Well, if you got nothing else out of this, the whole point was why Mrs. Surratt would talk so openly this way. I mean, all these brother against brother, the bloodiest, nastiest civil war in the history of the world was the American Civil War. And now that it's over, she's still talking in this racist way. And, uh, and so I just thought I'd pull out once again to put it on record where this stuff comes from and why it won't die. It's because the agents of evil are playing all sides against each other. And, uh, you know, because we, we struggle with identity, uh, we allow this monster to become our tormentor when God calls us to be overcomers. And I want to remind you of something that was at the beginning of the first article. Three out of four uh, captured uh, Africans died from starvation on the way to America. So that alone should tell you that the people who landed here were not weak people. Amen, somebody. <laughs> These were very strong amen. people. Amen, we amen. And survived all of them. And we are descendants of the strongest of the people, not the weakest. Uh, iPhone, I don't know if that's Sister Watts or whoever, come on in. Yes, it is, Pastor. Yes, mm -hmm. sir. After reading just this passage alone, if that was well known and exposed to the entire public, be they Muslims, Christians, even the Jews themselves, it would have eliminated a lot of the fighting and the bickering that's going on. It would have created an entirely new avenues who, for which everyone could really worship and respect the next segment that is out here. But this is the first time even me and having Muslim relatives in that faith, even hearing this, even if I listened to Muhammad uh, and Malcolm and all that, I've never heard this exposed as such. And even the individuals themselves never explained this to me. Yeah, you, you're right, uh, Mother Watts. But you know, the issue here is it requires courage. Yes. And, and that is in short supply today. You know, people who have their, who built their kingdoms and their churches and their faith base, uh, they don't want to lose their power and they don't want to lose their money. Absolutely. So, they, so even if they know better, they let it roll on. And then sometimes they don't want to go up against such a large organization. Exactly. So they, they go of the, the, for the low hanging fruit. They just leave the big organizations alone. Yeah, and it shows how the Jesuits were in effect and any power and broadening their horizons at that point. You see what I'm saying? Other than just political and religious, they were, you know, dipping and dabbing in a lot of other things and thinking of ways to uh, divide and conquer, if I can use that term. Yes, that is exactly, that is the precise correct term because what they have managed to do, remember we're talking 1900 when they got this in place, right? Yes. So what, so what is the result of it? They did with psychology what they could never do on the battlefield. They now have control of three groups making pilgrimages. The, the Catholic got to make a, 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 a pilgrim to the Vatican before they die. The, the Muslim got to make a pilgrimage to Mecca before they die. And the Jew got to make a pilgrimage to Jerusalem before they die. And guess what's in all three of those places? All three different religions under control by the Catholic Church. Yes, sir. 
Now that's deep. I don't want y'all to chew on that. Maybe you sleep on it and you'll wake up in a cold sweat. I just realized what he said. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but they have literally one third of the world making pilgrimage pilgrimages to places they control. So how do you know that, Pastor Hood? When you look in Mecca and the places of worship, you'll see Mother Mary. When you go to Jerusalem, you'll see a mosque sitting on the dome of the rock. And when you go to the Vatican, you'll see representation for both Catholics, Muslims, and Jews at the Vatican. Yes. And a new wide world hotel going up over there too. <laughs> That's another issue, but okay. Yeah. Yeah. And so, so they don't care. It's just like Procter and Gamble. I don't care what soap you buy. As long as you buy soap, you buy them from me. As long as you buy toothpaste, you buy it from me. It, it's, it's, it's a racket. And that's why it is such a radical idea. The Protestants say, go to God yourself. That's why that caused the Inquisition. That's why it caused war to make that simple statement, bypass the priest and go to God yourself. Open that Bible and read it yourself. That caused war. And we are still at war, Mother Watch. It's not over. This war is not over, even though we close our eyes, put our fingers in our ears, you know, hear no evil, see no evil, speak no evil. It don't matter. We're still at war. Absolutely. All yes. right. I'm going to stop. I'm preaching tonight. Are we supposed Thank to be you. That's all right. That's all right. I'm good. I'm sorry. That's all right. We need you preaching. <laughs> Amen. Amen. And we got it bad in America, too. We, we, we hate it. I saw a thing today where uh, uh, this lady is talking to Senate, this professor at some school, and a senator asked her in this hearing, uh, you know, uh, it, it, she literally said, this isn't about Roe versus Wade. This is about a much bigger issue. He asked her what the issue is. He, she's talking about men being able to have babies. And he, he, she asked him, do you think a man could have a baby? He said, well, no. And she said, <laughs> and she, see, you're homophobic. And she just started saying, oh, no. Forget. I said, this is crazy. But nonetheless, Brother Parker, stop me. Go ahead and, and, and bring us back. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> That's all. Roe versus Wade thing. I'm gonna jump back to what I was gonna say. Over mm -hmm. in France, they artificially inseminated a man who was translated, transformed, or whatever you call it, trans. You know, had an operation to become a woman. They artificially inseminated him, and he became pregnant. That's where all these people over in America are getting a man can have a baby. That's where all that's coming from. Over in France, a man was artificially inseminated after he had been surgically changed to become a woman. He got pregnant and he had, a, well, he had a baby. That's why all of this uh, yeah. craziness is coming from over in America, talking about a man can have a baby. That's where it's all coming from. It, it, it's, on, it's in the news and everything, you know, yeah, it's all but there. Yeah. Well, I don't want to go down that road. Uh, I know Billy it. said it, rabbit holes, but my <laughs> God, I, I know I brought it up, but I want to get back to the lesson. All right. <laughs> what, I, what, I, what, I, what I was going to say was <laughs> on the lesson itself yeah. was that what people don't realize, and it's in a book, Ecclesiastical Megalomania, all of the religions over in the Middle East, come out Muslim, Jews, they were all created by the Catholic religion. Yeah. And you said it You said it earlier, if you look on top of every one of their churches or mosques, whatever, you will see the Virgin Mary. And then back yeah. to what you were saying earlier about the black Muslims. The reason they do not know about this is because they listen to their leaders and their leaders teach them all about the hate of the Europeans instead of mm -hmm. teaching them also that the Muslim trade was going on. They'll tell you them in, they'll argue, not argue you down. No, there is nothing. The black man did not enslave the black man. It was all the Europeans. Yes, he did. <laughs> but that's what they're yeah, being taught, yeah. and that's what they believe. Mm -hmm. It's just like the false teachers in Protestantism. They teach you about the dead and all that stuff. The dead is going, when they die, they go to heaven and all that stuff. How many people act 
actually believe that because they do not want to accept the truth because of what they were taught and what they want to believe. See, that's that's why all this is just that you're doing on this uh, secret secret terrorist is letting us know historically what happened. And again, it is going to happen because the Catholic Church is bringing everything back that way, where they will be the leaders and the and, and the sole uh, ruler of this world because they want to go back to where they were during the time of feudalism. They want to be the ones yeah. that dictate what everybody believes because they have taught all religions or uh, created all religions so they can bring them all back to them, which they are doing right now. I'm done. Yes. Yes, sir. Well, thank you. Uh, this is true. And uh, before this is over with, we're going to show y'all some quotes of these bishops saying over and over again that Rome is going to rule with an iron hand once again. And what they were alluding to is they want to institute the death penalty again through the church. Amen. And if you don't think it's possible, look at this chapter we're reading now. We're talking about a conspiracy to kill a president that expanded across the globe. It was planned, financed, and everything else through multiple parties from multiple countries, including a church. And people will still say, oh man, y'all crazy. If somebody had that kind of conspiracy, somebody would say something. Well, they do say something. Y'all don't want to listen. <laughs> they ain't never stop saying something. And that's what we're reading. Go ahead. Uh, Amen. Go Park. <laughs> Chapter four. President Abraham Lincoln, page 50. Right after Lincoln's death, John Surratt, who was part of the assassination conspiracy, fled to Montreal. From Montreal, he was taken to Liverpool, England, and then to Rome. Hmm. When a United States official finally caught up with him, he was found Pope's personal army. Look at there. A conspirator in the assassination of Abraham Lincoln was a member of the Pope's personal army. Three or four hours before Lincoln was murdered in Washington, the 14th of April, 1865, that murder was not only known by someone, but it was circulated and talked of in the streets and in the houses of the priestly and Romish town of St. Joseph, Minnesota. The fact is undeniable. The testimonies are unchangeable, unchallengeable. And there were no railroad nor any telegraph communications nearer than 40 or 80 miles from St. Joseph. Mm. Mr. Lineman, who is a Roman Catholic, tells us that though he heard this from many in his store and in the streets, he does not remember the name of a single one who told him that. But if the memory of Mr. Lineman is so deficient on that subject, we can help him and tell him what was said with mathematical accuracy. The priests of St. Joseph were often visiting Washington and boarding probably at Mrs. Surratt's those priests of Washington were in daily communication with their co-rebel priests of St. Joseph. They were their intimate, they were their intimate friends. There was no secret among them. The details of the murder, as the day selected for its commission, were as well known among the priests of St. Joseph as they were among those of Washington. Yeah, what kind of preachers are these? Yeah. <laughs> How could the priest conceal such a joyful event from their bosom friend, Mr. Lineman? He was their confidential man. He was their purveyor. He was their right-hand man among the faithful of St. Joseph. Mm. I guess they make it clear. <laughs> yeah. There's the so much more material. <laughs> In the trial of John Surratt, a French minister by the name of Rufus King stated this, I believe that he, John Surratt, 
is protected by the clergy and that the murder is the result of a deep laid plot, not only against the life of President Lincoln, but against the existence of this Republic. As we are aware that the priesthood and royalty are and always have been opposed to liberty. Burt McCarthy, the suppressed truth about the assassination of Abraham Lincoln. A real Varner published in page 185. Page 51, chapter four. Four people were tried, convicted, and executed by hanging for the assassination of Abraham Lincoln. Their names were Davy Harrell, Louis Payne, George Atzerod, and Mary E. Surratt. They were all Roman Catholics. That information is in Ford's theater and several glass cases showing many things about Lincoln, the Civil War, and his assassination. As Abraham Lincoln was being assassinated, an attempt was also made to assassinate William Seward, the Secretary of State. There was also to be an attempt on the life of Ulysses S. Grant, but Grant had to take an emergency trip to New Jersey to be at the bedside of a dying relative. Andrew Johnson, the Vice President of the United States, was also to be assassinated at this time. The man who was to kill him became scared and ran off, riding on a horse into the country and did not carry out his part of the plan. Is this uh, 1860 whatever or is this January 6th? Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Lewis Payne, known as the Florida boy, an athletic young giant who some months before had joined the conspiracy rode up to the front of the residence of the Secretary of State, William Seward. William Seward had been ill for three weeks, suffering from a fractured jaw, the result of the running away of his team that was under the constant care of male nurses. Payne rang the doorbell and it was answered by the colored butler. He told the latter that he had been sent with some medicine which he must take to the sick room. The butler refused to allow him to enter, saying that he had orders to allow no one to Mr. Seward's room. The stranger, Louis Payne, after a short struggle, knocked him down and went bounding up the stairs. He rushed into the sick chamber after filling each of the two sons of the secretary, he, Louis Payne, then sprang upon the sick man and seriously stabbed him three times. By a superhuman effort, the latter struggled out of the bed with his assailant who left him in a heap on the floor, bleeding from the wounds he had inflicted. After his murderous assault on Seward, the ruffian rushed down the stairs yelling at the top of his voice, I am mad, I am mad. And he probably was. He was entirely under the control of the hypnotic influences of the wicked people in whose power he had allowed himself to be. Now, be it, pages 121 and 122. Yeah, he was demon. Now, please, yeah, well, remember this part. As long ago, this is over, what, almost 150 years ago? Remember this because it's going to be a recurring theme when important people in our government are, are murdered and assassinated. It's going to be a lone, per, a lone person claiming to be crazy. Mm -hmm. It's going to be the same thing again and again and again. But as you see, that's why we're studying this. So as you see, this is a wide conspiracy with a whole lot of intricate details, and they were able to pull it off without the our officials knowing what was going on. Okay, and they don't, and and conspirators don't get worse; they get better at, at what they do. Amen. Okay. Well, let's it continue. Has happened already. In our recent, mm -hmm. in our recent past, with some of the presidents that we have had, and some of the people that work for them, mysteriously disappeared or had freak accidents. Mm -hmm. 
It was yeah, part man. of the plan. I'm not going to name any names. <laughs> it was well, part I will. Of the <laughs> I will. Everybody who knew what, all the dirt that Clinton was doing kept shooting themselves in the back of the head with a shotgun. I don't know how they could do that. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Amen. All right. Uh, Elder Billy, go ahead. <laughs> um, there are certain parts of, um, I'm trying to think, of uh, what do they call them in foreign countries, our embassies. Mm -hmm. And there were certain rooms where, where I know y'all have heard of this, where they can't detect what it is, but it's, it's deadening their, their minds, their ears, they can hear stuff is ringing. They were saying some of this was in the White House. Did you hear anything about that? Oh, no, I haven't. I looked into that. Um, yeah, they're, 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 they're some kind of sickness where they're coming back and they're staying sick at home and you can't detect it. It's not, they don't know if it's in the air vents or nothing like that, but mm. they closed one place down all together where the people left, but they're becoming sick, like what this Russian guy is doing, you know, but mm -hmm. they can't figure it out, but it's up in the White, uh, White House City. That's all. Yeah, thank you. I'm gonna look into that. I, I did hear because you know I don't watch a lot of TV, but I did hear the other day because somebody asked me why we're not hearing nothing about uh, Ukraine. So I said, let me go see what's going on. And the last thing I saw was a clip where Putin said, "Oh, we just getting started." Mm -hmm. I took note of that. I said we're just getting started. Mm -mm -mm. Amen. Go ahead because I wanna I wanna get us done by nine. So go ahead, Elder uh, Elder Parker. Yeah. It was part of the plan that Michael Laughlin, one of the conspirators from Baltimore, was to have murdered General Grant that night. This was mm -hmm. not possible, owing to the change in the general's plans. To Atzerod, it failed to assassinate Vice President Johnson, but he became frightened, spent the day riding into the country on a horse. He was found several days after with relatives of his below, relatives of his below Washington. He made a written confession before he was executed, which confirmed the presence of Surratt in Washington, that fatal day of fact, which nine reputable witnesses had sworn to. I did, page 122. Page 53, chapter four. Thus we have a conspiracy to kill not only the president, but to bring the government of the United States completely into chaos. Do we not see the fulfillment of the Council of Vienna and Verona at work in 1865? Do we not see the hand of the Jesuit order and the Roman Catholic Church to destroy this great country? It was an awful time in the history of the United States. Mm. We have already seen that the Roman Catholic Church sowed the seed of division between the two great sections of this country, dividing North from South on the burning question of slavery. That division was her golden op opportunity to crush one by the other and reign over the bloody ruins of both. A favorite- Can we pause right there? Because sure. this is so important. And this is what I keep telling y'all. Because because we want to team up. We want to potsy up. Oh, I'm blue. I'm red. And now uh, this is the game right here. It's right in this sentence. That division was her golden opportunity to crush one by the other. And what I want you to know is that from a Jesuit point of view, they don't care which one crushed the other. Go ahead, Elder Parker. That division was a golden opportunity to crush one by the other and reign over the bloody ruins of both, a favorite long-standing policy. She hoped that the hour of her supreme triumph over this continent was come. Mm. She ordered the emperor of France to be ready with an army in Mexico, ready to support the South, and she bade mm. all Roman Catholics to enroll themselves under the banners of slavery by joining themselves to the Democratic Party. Lord have mercy. The is that, does that say the Democratic Party? 
Mm-hmm. Well, they say Elder, Elder Parker that they switched. The Democrats became Republicans and the Republicans became Democrats. Yeah, whatever. Go ahead. That's a Jesuit lie. <laughs> <laughs> Charles Kennedy, 50 years in the Church of Rome, Chick Publication, page 291. <laughs> Remember, Chenequa, Charles, it is a was a 50 was a pre Roman Catholic priest for 50 years. So Amen. he had the inside scoop. Remember that. Amen. Whew. He was an advisor to Abraham Lincoln. Mm -hmm. Abraham Lincoln said to Charles Tinique or Tinique. It don't matter. He, he don't hear. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I will be forever grateful for the warning words you have addressed to me about the dangers ahead to my life from Rome. I know they are not imaginary dangers. If I were fighting against the Protestant South as a nation, there would be no danger of assassination. Ain't that a shame? Mm -hmm. The nations who read the Bible fight bravely on the battlefield, but they do not assassinate their enemies. The Pope and the Jesuits with their infernal inquisition are the only organized powers in the world which have recourse to the dagger of the assassin to murder those they cannot convince with their arguments or conquer with the sword. There now it is. Who's speaking again? Who's talking? Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln. Now you call him a conspiracy theorist. He's the one talking. Okay. <laughs> Unfortunately, I feel more and more every day that it is not against the Americans of the South alone. I am fighting. It is more against the Pope of Rome, his perfidious Jesuits, and their blind and bloodthirsty slaves. As long as they hope to conquer the North, they will spare me. But the day we rout their armies, take their cities, and force them to submit, then it is my impression that the Jesuits who are the principal rulers of the South, would do what they have almost invariably done in the past. The dagger or the pistol would do what the strong hands of the warriors could not achieve. He had a lot of insight. This mm -hmm. civil war seems to be nothing but a political affair to those who do not see, as I do, the secret springs of that terrible drama. But it is more a religious, than a civil war. Mm. It is Rome who wants to rule and degrade the North as she has ruled and degraded the South from the very day of its discovery. Mm. There are only very few of the Southern leaders who are not more or less under the influence of the Jesuits through their wives, family relations, and their mm. friends. Several members of the family of Jeff Davis belong to the Church of Rome. But it is very certain that if the American people could learn what I know of the fierce hatred of the priests of Rome against our institutions, our schools, our most sacred rights, and our so dearly bought liberties, they would drive them away tomorrow from among us, or they would shoot them as traitors. But you are the only one to whom I revealed these sad secrets for I know that you learned them before me. The history of these last thousand years tells us that wherever the church of Rome is not a dagger to pierce the bosom of a free nation. She is a stone to her neck to paralyze her and prevent her advance in the ways of civilization, science, intelligence, happiness, and liberty. Amid, pages 294 and 295. Page 55, chapter 4. Lincoln said, This war would never have been possible without the sinister influence of the Jesuits. We owe it to Popery that we now see our land reddened with the blood of her noblest sons. I pity the priests, the bishops, and the monks of Rome in the United States when the people realize that they are, in great part, responsible for the tears and the bloodshed in this war. 
I bid pages 296 and 297. The common people see and hear the big noisy wheels of the Southern Confederacy cars. They call them Jeff Davis, Lee, Toome, Beauregard, Simmons, etc. And they honestly think they are the motive power, the first cause of our troubles. But this is a mistake. The true motive power is secreted behind the thick walls of the Vatican, the colleges and schools of the Jesuits, the convents of the nuns, and the confessional boxes of Rome. I bid page 305. Page 56, chapter four. In fulfilling the councils of Vienna, Verona, and Cherie, the Catholic Church divided the North and the South through their agent, John C. Calhoun. They sought to destroy the economy through Nicholas Biddle, and then they used the poison cup and the assassin's bullet to assassinate and to attempt to assassinate a total of five presidents within a span of 25 years. Now let's just pause and digest that. Five presidents within the span of 25 years were had, it, were, had an attempt of assassination on their life and a couple of times they were successful. Don't y'all think that's strange? Yep. Amen. And one of them that they tried to assassinate he uh, resigned because he stayed sick all the time. Mm -hmm. They reddened American soil with the blood of thousands of American young men in the terrible Civil War. Oh, that we had the eyes to see that Rome never changes. What she did, she is still doing today. Yeah. May God help us to understand the evil of the Roman papacy then and now. All right, that's the end of chapter four. Uh, the uh, President Abraham Lincoln. And there is always a temptation to say, well, Pastor Hood, that was way back then. That ain't got nothing to do with now. Well, just you better read the rest of the book <laughs> because we're going to come all the way up to today. And these other chapters are very similar with all kind of receipts and documentation of Jesuit activity. Okay, so uh, we need your feedback and your thoughts before we close out tonight. Any thoughts on what you've heard? Any questions? Sister Whitlock. Yes, I just want to say that proves that the Bible is the word of God because it says that Satan knows that he has but a short time. Satan knew that this was the earth that was to help the woman. And like mm -hmm. you presidents that he's been killing and you said a little while ago that January 6th you know I could see Satan behind that the person that was behind it he just looks evil okay and you know the plots they were gonna he was gonna kill the vice president you know yes I, I'm not his vice president yeah vice <laughs> president and because you know, Satan wants worship, you know, he's a person that just thinks about himself. The only assurance that I have when I look at that January 6th is just, is that I remember that the Lord is, the Lord is constantly as he's going to and fro throughout. And this land, America, God put it there for a reason. This is where the Adventist message really got its roots. And I think that's why those who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus is going to be the object of his, um, the, uh, the object of Satan, okay? Because he wants mm -hmm. worship. But Jesus said he's going to cut it short in righteousness. Just like he knew when to open the Red Sea, he knows when to come in the cars of heaven. And I, I just have to trust in him that he knows how far to let it go. Amen. And that's our, that's our only hope with all this. Otherwise, this will all be very depressing. Uh, you know, the only reason we can 
um, focus on this and look at it is because we know in the back of our minds that the Lord uh, will uh, see us through in the end. But we have to be sober, though. You know, we can't be drunk with the wine of Babylon. We can't be sleep or else we'll be a part of the loss. All right. Thank you so much, Sister Whitlock. And thank you, uh, Elder Parker. That was a lot of reading. So we appreciate you getting us through the end of that chapter. Uh, anyone else have any questions or thoughts before we close tonight? I got to say a lot of learning. <laughs> Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. We are certainly marching on down the road. Uh, Deacon King, man. The, um, the book is a great asset to wake us up. And Sister Betty so wonderfully gave a rendition. And the, 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 the formula that we have to keep ourselves aware of is not to be afraid. And um, like you so highlighted at the beginning or in the middle, that we have to be willing to stay strong and stay faithful and acknowledge God and acknowledge Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit and continue to move. And no matter what happens to any of us, none of us can be intimidated and stopped for fear of the Roman Catholic or for the Jesuits to know that even we might have some implants within the Seventh-day Adventist organization as well. But since we know the truth and God is the source that will mend and straighten all this out, if it doesn't take place in our living generation, it eventually will. And that we have to stay faithful and study the word, because if we don't take on the discipline of scripture, we are hypocrites and um, are, are becoming um, influenced by the world because we know these hidden Jesuits are at, at war and they put uh, distractions in many places, but God is the source of victory. And so even in our, if we look at ourselves and our individual history and compare it to where we are now, thank God that we are members of the remnant church and that we are willing to stand up and speak up and continue to be um, Sabbath keepers. And not only that, to be royal participants in our obligation with our tithes and offerings and to not get caught up with material possessions, but to feed ourselves continually on our spiritual diet and continue to study the word of Second Timothy 2.15 to show ourselves approved the workmen or workwoman of God that needeth not be ashamed, rightly discerning the word of truth. So with that said, we know that the motherland is where the Garden of Eden is, and that's Africa. And that the eyes of truth is that of how Revelations tells us. And as we continue to study and see that God has skin like brass, hair like wool, and the other the components that all of us know. But that's not a material thing, right? That's a truth. And as we know who we are, the descendants of truth and righteousness, and as you are teaching us about the, the journey of Abraham and how we stand right now, let us keep being faithful and feed each other and serve and encourage each other and rightly discerning the truth and give praise and thanks for the teaching of you, Pastor Hood, and your, your wonderful wife, Sister Hood, and your family. And all of us, let's embrace and continue to move forward and acknowledge God as the truth of who we are, his people, his children, his descendants. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Brother King. Amen. Man, uh, last night, uh, uh, what he's referring to is in our master class last night, we had some other receipts. We went to the rabbis on you. 
you know, <laughs> we went to the Greek letters to show uh, the the uh, uh, the color of Abraham and Sarah. That, so he's referring to, but hey, it's not um, the end all and be all for us. What makes it an issue is people trying so much to cover it up. Why you need to cover that up? All right, yeah. Elder Hood, go ahead. Mm -hmm. I just want to say, you know, it's a lot to um, absorb at one time, you know, just personally. So, you know, the ability to go back and, you know, play it over. And even then, I still don't get every single detail. But what I do know is I believe God in that he says that, you know, in the appointed, if we just but um as uh deacon king um uh, deacon kingman said well, we study to show ourselves approved unto god and we know a workman need rightly dividing the word of truth and so these sessions that we're having um in reference to just educating us on um world events and how it ties into bible prophecy um I, I just I just I choose to believe God that um, as long as I'm storing it in, as long as I'm putting it in at the appropriate time, God's going to help me sort it out, <laughs> you know, right. in my brain. And so I and, and I just wanted wanted to say that in the event someone on the line needs to be encouraged. So, you know, I don't allow myself to feel you know, oh boy, I don't get everything because, I mean, oh, Pastor Hook can go deep sometime, and I'm like, Lord, you know, um, but it's okay um, because I'm positioning myself, and as long as I'm in the position and in the spirit of learning and receiving and just saying, Lord, here I am pouring to me everything that you so desire to pour in, and I trust that at the appointed time when I need it, uh, by the power of your Holy Spirit, um, you're going to help me, you're going to remind me, and you're going to give me exactly what it is I need. And I take that from Moses, you know, was it Moses? Let me get my people right. Um, um, yeah, in reference to, um, you know, just trusting God with what it is I need to say, what I need to to know and when I need to know it and when it's valuable. So I just encourage those on the line who may feel a little overwhelmed not to feel that way because your faith is not being able to get it all. It's trusting that God is still God and the Holy Spirit is going to do exactly what he uh, is qualified to do, which is lead and guide us into all truth. And so I appreciate um, the lessons, Pastor Hood, and I just pray that the Lord, um, by his spirit, cover you. Um, and I say that because, um, you know, you're, you, you're doing a, a work that puts you on, on front street. And so I just, um, yeah, plead the blood of Jesus over your life and ask God to keep you and your family covered. Teach Sister Hood, teach. Amen. Amen. All right. Uh, you know, I'll save my comments for after this next part. I don't know who you are. You got your hand up. U six nine three CL. Go ahead. Go ahead. You, you saw you unmute yourself. Go ahead. U C L U six nine three CL. Okay. Must they must be having uh, technical difficulties, uh, but but here's the here's the deal. You don't have to remember all this stuff. Oh, their audio went out. Okay, you you don't have to remember all this stuff. All you need to remember is that you cannot put your hopes and dreams and trust in this world. You got to put your, you got to, what's the song say? Build your hopes on things eternal. Hold to his unchanging hand. That's really the message throughout. Uh, you know, don't get too comfortable listening to what people in this world tell you because it's really coming down to two forces. There's the Lord versus Satan. And whose side are we going to be on? That's really, there's no neutral spot in the end. There's no safe place where you don't have to choose. In the end, we're going to have to pick a side. And it is Satan himself that's going to force us to pick a side. 
Okay. I don't see any other hands. Brother Mike, you want to see something? Amen. 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 Now, uh, uh, hmm, man, I forgot. Oh, Brother King man's comment about infiltration. I have a video on firsthand testimonies about Jesuit infiltration into the Adventist church. I'll just play it at the appropriate time because I know I'm throwing a whole bunch of stuff at, at y'all. <laughs> so, but at the appropriate time, I'm going to play that video where regular church members talk about how Jesuits infiltrated the uh, Adventist church over the years. Now, uh, there are some things that Jesuits have done uh, that even Adventists, uh, by and large, aren't ready to deal with. There are some things that we uh, have been got, gotten so accustomed to, and some of them aren't so harmful, but they're not accurate. For instance, uh, you know, some, some Latin words that, that have been, that have replaced Hebrew words or, or uh, Aramaic words. And, and they have done that on purpose because they want to make it easier to make one world religion. So they try to make some of these words sound the same. So they put Jesus in the place of these ascended masters as if he's their equal. And the first way of doing it is changing his image and changing his name. But even Adventists don't want to hear that. So I'll save it for another time. All right, <laughs> next week, we are... somebody know what I'm talking about in here. Don't leave me hanging. <laughs> hey man, I know what you're talking about. <laughs> next Wednesday, we're going to be talking about the Titanic. Oh, man, if your mind has been blown already, put your seatbelt on, pray without ceasing, because you ain't going to believe what happened to the Titanic. But for now, let's just have a word of prayer and, uh, and let's uh, get ready to close. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for uh, how you have uh, watched over us. We thank you for the history lesson. And most of all, Lord, I pray that the programming that we have experienced as children, we've been taught to hate history, we've been taught to, to go to sleep when it comes to learning, uh, that you shake that off of us, that you remove that spell from us and help us to enjoy learning. And as we go forward, Lord, give us an opportunity to share this with others is our prayer in Jesus' name, amen and amen. Oh, somebody wants to make Elder Brooks. Go ahead. Yeah, remind us about Friday. Yes, yes, yes. Want to invite you all for Friday uh, for uh, our Sabbath school program is going to be at Southeast. We're going to have a panel for this particular uh, 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 this particular uh, service. Uh, your, uh, your pastor and his lovely wife will be on there. It'll be Gary King and his lovely wife, Myra, and Sister Charity and her husband, Ruel. So we're going to do a, uh, we're going to do a panel discussion. We won't have a uh, children's uh, story this week. We're going to cancel out on that one. We'll be back next week. So for the children, but we'll be broadcasting from Southeast, but we invite you and encourage you. It's going to be great weather. Come down for Sabbath school uh, that, you know, uh, this coming Friday night. And then also that's going to be in a small parking lot. And then Park and Praise will continue Sabbath night. We're going to close out with a wonderful uh, sing-along uh, to close the Sabbath. Uh, for those who are used to the Gaithers, who know the Gaithers, you're going to, you know how the Gaithers gather around. We're going to have a wonderful time singing songs and, and praising God together. So come out, bring your best voice. If you can't sing, then just sing anyway. Do your best. And then, um, you know, we're going to have a movie. We're going to have a movie that night called The Overcomer Outside. It's going to be great. We're going to have, uh, we're going to have also, uh, we're going to be a fundraiser. Uh, doesn't cost you anything for the movie, but we're going to have snacks and stuff. And uh, they will cost a couple, you know, just a dollar or two. And whatever, you know, it's going to the women's ministry, which is Elder, um, which is uh, uh, Elder Hoods, uh, uh, who's the head of uh, who is the head of women's ministry is Elder Elder Hood. Sorry about that, sisterhood. But anyway, <laughs> uh, we just we invite you all come out. Come on, we're gonna have a great time. I I invite you all to come out. Bring your lawn chairs. 
have some good times. Let's go back to the kind of go back in the old times and, and just have a great time out worshiping God this weekend. Thanks. Thanks, Pastor. Amen. Thank you. And 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 you covered it all. And we're we're still remember this is also uh, we have a guest speaker this Sabbath uh, for women's ministry. She's going to continue the series that I've been doing uh, on the remnant. And also right after church, we're still going out to pass out tracks. It only takes about 30 minutes. We're still going to do that. Uh, so just just buckle in and be prepared to do old fashioned church where we just kind of hanging out with each other just about all day. And if you let yourself enjoy it, you will. We're looking forward to a great time both Friday uh, evening to, to bring in the Sabbath and both Sabbath evening to close the Sabbath. Old time, fun times. All right. Uh, so uh, let's see. I don't see any other hands from any other leaders. So let's go ahead and.